I was known in Holocaust. I was known in Holocaust studies, but I hadn't really made much of a move into genocide studies. And so in the presentation, um, there were four very discreet uh, uh, pr uh, presentations, one of which was Shelley Baranowski, a very well-known uh, historian of the World War II, of World War II, and also in relation to Holocaust studies. But what was surprising to me was that in the attempt to analyze genocide, there was a, a very important piece missing. And I wasn't never, I was never quite sure why uh, that piece was missing. And it was the idea of victim phenomenology. So in 2012, I published another essay uh, dealing with that experience and talking about what it means to argue for a continuity in genocide studies between ancient world massacres and modern day extermination and what that what happened then to victims themselves in this discussion. That piece um, ended up uh, causing me to write this book called uh, The Victims of Slavery, Colonization, and the Holocaust, Persecution, a Comparative History, or a Comparative History of Persecution. And it was tied absolutely to the idea that we cannot forget victims in the study of genocide. It's important in terms of genocide prevention, yes, to look at who becomes a, a who becomes committed to genocide, who, is, who are its agents or its actors. But what I wanted to look at was what happened to victims of persecution and were they really on a continuum of oppression? Was it something that you know, we could limit then to um, a kind of historical timeline? People were oppressing people and committing genocide in the ancient world, they were doing it in the medieval world, they were doing it in the modern world. So I, I questioned that and I questioned it from the perspective of the victim. And as someone who is both a Holocaust study scholar but also a literature professor, I felt like I had a kind of um, approach that was uniquely different from some of my colleagues tied very much to the way we organize knowledge when we talk about genocide studies, the way we organize knowledge, the way we talk about history, and the way that we organize knowledge when we talk about victims. So they're very different axes that I want to talk about. In any case, this book um, deals with three case studies, and I made them specifically case studies because I wanted to look at whether or not we could say that the victims of slavery and the victims of colonization were somehow related to the victims of extermination in the Holocaust and genocide. And I wanted to see if that, if that bore out. And this gave me an incredible opportunity because usually in Holocaust studies, you don't look at transnational comparative experiences outside of the Holocaust. You can look at, for example, you can compare what happens in Central Europe to what happens in Eastern Europe to what happens to Western Europe and when you're doing just Holocaust studies. In genocide studies, it was a bit different because you would have individuals that would want to talk about genocides, for example, in Rwanda. In fact, you're going to have the ambassador here, I believe, at the end of the series, which is she's very exciting. And um, you would also have a discussion of, say, for example, when I teach Holocaust and genocide studies here at State, I talk about the Holocaust, Rwanda and Armenia. And I do it in a very specific way because I want to frame how the category of genocide becomes a legal category and how it works. But oftentimes when we're looking at Holocaust and genocide, again, the missing piece is always tied to how people actually experienced it if they were the targets of its victimization. So for slavery, I went to a very specific small case study. And the idea of this was that transatlantic slavery lasts 400 years. It has extreme amounts of data and material. And I didn't want to get lost in that. I wanted one case study that would allow me to reach out and look at related or adjacent case studies and related experiences. And this brought me to Barbados and the uh, uh, experience of West Indian slavery. From that 
case study, I began to conduct ethnographic um, interviews with Barbadians today living in the UK and in Barbados. And one of the things that I wanted to try and determine was how much was inherited, how much was in fact, um, uh, how much was inherited, how much was something that was collectively internalized, how much of the experience did they know today, many, many years afterwards, and what kinds of narrative elements were communicated to them through their own family members. So that meant that I was really looking for, was there a kind of um, body of material that was transmitted generation by generation, how did it differ from the original experiences of it? And what kinds of things did they consider important now, today, in this modern moment, in terms of understanding the legacy of slavery in their own personal experience? And this brought me then to the, uh, the Monument of the Unknown Slave, which popularly in Barbados is called the Busa Monument. And it's, it's almost, it's, on the one hand, the sculptor, the artist never intended for it to be called the Busa Monument. But when Barbadians saw it, the minute they saw it, it was Busa. And Busa was the failed, uh, he, he led a failed insurrection against slavery. And that monument became a signifier every time they saw it. People, it's in a part of a traffic circle. And every time anybody drives around it, it's what they talk about, it's what they see. It organizes their thinking because it's the picture of a slave breaking the shackles, standing up tall and presenting himself to the world as a free man. And it becomes a huge image that constantly is repeated. When, Holo uh, when, Holocaust, when slavery historians attempted to um, disabuse Barbadians of this particular figure of Busa, and it was a big deal. Jerome Handler is perhaps the most well-known historian. He argued that, you know, we don't have any record of this kind of figure. And it came right back, Barbadians came right back with, we believe this figure is integral to the memory of the legacy of slavery because it's the image of this slave standing up and declaring himself free. Now, this led me to think then about how slavery constructs a kind of ethos. And I began to think in the book about what kinds of attitudes go into the slavery, the slave holder or the slave owner, and what kinds of attitudes does the slave adopt. And this brought me then to a legal formula that was first analyzed by a jurist in Barbados by the name of Elsa Govea. Govea is almost unknown outside of the West Indies, and she's really she was one of the really great and innovative novel historians of slavery in that part of the world. But she came up with a thesis and it was really very basic. And under slavery, slaves were understood as res nullius. And res nullius is the ownership, the ownerless being. It was a being that existed purposely to be owned and was not owned yet. And that res nullius being had to be converted into merchandise. And that process took place on the boat coming in, after they took slaves into captivity, they you know, got them, they get them on the boats to bring them to their targeted uh, area where they're going to be enslaved. And then they were converted from merchandise into chattel. And that formula became the element of understanding slavery in Barbados, that you would exist as res nullius, then you would be tra transformed into merchandise and then from merchandise to chattel, you would become owned. So Busa articulated this incredible moment in the imagination of generations of Barbadians coming after the fact, this incredible moment where they were no longer owned, they were liberated, they were literally freed. And that image stuck with the entire, I mean, I, I conducted quite a few ethnographic um, interviews and it kept coming up over and over again, the need to remember being freed, being coming freed and doing it yourself. 
Now, the second case study that I worked on was in terms of the Herero and the Nama and German Southwest Africa. And this is a very important element. And I did this purposely because of what happened with that initial genocide conference in 2010, where I was uh, exposed for the first time to the continuity thesis. And the continuity thesis, as I mentioned earlier, argues that the genocide and the Holocaust, these events of the present right now, are not necessarily unique in human history. That in fact, you can go all the way back to the ancient world, to Sparta, to a variety of historical antecedents, and you can see extermination and genocide operating on a continuum. So there's a continuity. One of the problems with the continuity thesis is that it erases victim specificity and victim experience in the present here and now in order to kind of create an epistemological frame that allows you to identify who the person is that is committing the genocide, who the group is, who the nation is. It allows you to look at oppression almost as a monolithic construction in time and space throughout history. And so to some extent then that colonial case study that I wanted to look at was the experience of the Herero and the Nama. For those of you who don't know much about the Herero and the Nama, and then you also may not know about German colonial history, Germany, German colonial history didn't have the same history and length breadth of other colonial powers in Europe. It was something that particularly bothered their leader Bismarck. But what was interesting about German colonial history um, was that they went for a place that they called German Southwest Africa. They had other colonial properties or territories, but German Southwest Africa is now today known as the country of Namibia. And at the time, the two primary, the largest groups, there were several indigenous groups, but the two largest indigenous groups were the Herero and the Nama. And the Nama were uniquely different from the Herero. The Herero had a kind of length and genealogy. They had a, um, a connection to this place that went on for several you know, centuries. The Nama were actually related to what we call the Orlans group. And they were a group that was both based in South Africa, the Cape Colony, and they were also based in what would become Namibia or German Southwest Africa. They were also organized into clans with a captain leading each one. Why is that important? Because one of the things that happens when the Germans come in, they attempt to colonize by contract. They issue contracts to these different uh, clans and they attempt to take over the region based on this contract. And they have one person that kind of stops them and that's Hendrik Witboy. Hendrik Witboy, when he's approached by von Francois, the German captain that has been charged by Bismarck to colonize this area, Hendrik Witboy says to them, to von Francois, why would I cede power to you when I already have power? I already run this whole area. Why would I give that up? You don't live here. You've just arrived. This is my land. This belongs to me. And von Francois comes back immediately with, you know, it doesn't actually belong to you because I have this map and it's already been ceded to me. This is ceded to, to Prussia. Now that, I'm putting this in very simple terms for you, but you have to understand this set up the idea that German Southwest Africa and Africa in general was part of what we would call a terra nullis, a land that wasn't owned. And therefore the colonial powers could come in and they defined their ownership according to the map and then they seeded these colonies. Carl Brink wrote that first map in 1761. He, does, he was the first cartographer. He accompanied the Hendrik Hopp expedition coming out of the Cape Colony. The idea of it was that they wanted to find 
two things. They wanted to find beasts that could do labor in the colony. And then perhaps they would find a civilized people of Africans that they could recognize as subjects like themselves. That second element, the civilized people, was never actually anything they were looking too hard for. They were looking for beasts of burden. And at the same time, Brink, when he drew up his map, it's a very large three panel map that sits in the, the Dutch archives. And um, when he drew up the map, he had pictures of Nama, Hendrik Whitboy's tribal group. He had pictures of Namas around the boundary between the Cape Colony and German Southwest Africa. They were dancing and they were waiting in the pictures in the inscription, waiting for their European overlords to come and discover them. This was the whole idea between, behind the Brink map. And so the sense of it was that they took this map, they came in and they were going to find this unknown, unowned land, this land that they could possess and it would be theirs. It was the blank slate they were looking for. And this set up another formula in terms of colonialism and colonization. Terra nullius plus the map would equal the colony. In other words, terra nullius like res nullius, these were phenomena. They had no definition until they were given a definition, a concept that would be the map. And the object that we would know, the object of knowledge would be the colony. Now, this allowed colonial powers to envision Africa, what they called the dark continent, to envision Africa as a place that they could possess without any kind of legal obligation to anyone else besides another sovereign state. And this formula was bound, right, was bound to a constitutive experience of being a colonial subject. Finally, my third case study was tied to a picture at Yad Vashem. And that third case study was tied to the Holocaust. And it was all about the ash pits of Treblinka. This photograph came from 1960. And in fact, you know, I can, I can share my screen so you can see it. Um, let me see here for a second. Can you see it? You know, no, this isn't right. Hold yes, on. Yes, can see it. Are, are you seeing a map or are you seeing the a picture? Screen? Ah, good. Okay, that right here. Good. So this is all ash. In 1960, the Polish observer who was anonymous wrote on the back of the picture, it's as if I'm looking at a mountain of, of sand, a mountain. For those of you who aren't aware, Treblinka was part of the Reinhardt dedicated death camps. There were three official and then a fourth if we count Kelmnil. But the three official Reinhardt camps were Belzec, Sobibor, Treblinka. And as I'm sure you know from your course, their only purpose was to kill Jews. That was it, that was their only purpose. So this picture as my third case study made me start thinking what it would be like for individuals living in proximity to these ash pits or in the camp of Treblinka surviving in proximity to this very large crematoria. Because it's it, for Treblinka, it wasn't a crematoria per se. They had railroad ties over a large pit and they burned bodies continuously all the time on this pit and the ashes fell into the pit. And so this is what you're looking at. What's odd is that when the Nazis closed that camp down, when they closed that camp down, they constructed a kind of um, 
farmhouse and farmer. They put the Ukrainian guards in as farmers and they made it look like it was just a colony, just a settlement that, that all they had done, they were growing. In fact, they grew vegetables and crops on the ashes themselves, uh, on the ashes. And it was made to only look really just like a settlement like any other colonial settlement. And this brought me then to another aspect of this whole formula scenario. So in this case, the phenomenon was ens nullius, or a being that cannot be owned, that is impossible to own and therefore has no purpose. And this made me start thinking about victim phenomenology in a very specific way. And in a way to try and talk about why victims of genocides and victims of extermination can't be interchangeable with victims of oppression overall. My last, um, well, let's see, a couple of years back, I published an article again on this uh, about the subject experience of being in proximity to ashes, how it changed your senses, it changed your mental construct. I'm thinking of uh, one in particular uh, individual with whom I, I conducted an interview, the psychiatrist Anna Ornstein, Anna Ornstein. Anna was at Auschwitz twice and in between she was at other camps, but one of the things that she describes in her memoirs and in person uh, in, in our conversations was when she arrived, she could smell ashes in the air. And she was raving, she'd been in, you know, she was deported there through the, uh, the train cars. And one of the things that happens in um, the train cars is that you're confined, it's particularly, uh, it's a, a, a kind of suffocating experience. So she at, I think she was 16 or 17, she begins to kind of shut down mentally. And when she and her mother are pulled off of the train at the platform at Auschwitz and they're made to stand, she's already become somewhat, um, she's not insane, but she's raving. And, she, and so her mother's trying to quiet her and she can smell the ashes. And it was funny because she, it wasn't funny, but it, one of the things that she said that was really uh, odd to me was that she had never been able to talk about that smell. She talked about what she remembered going in and out of consciousness as she waited for where they would be sent. But one of the things that she was particularly shocked about was how those ashes still continued to be part of her mental thinking and they were an unarticulated part. She couldn't find the language or the words to explain them. And so those three case studies then became the basis for understanding how victims experience and what kinds of language and mental space and mental images they use to explain what's happened to them, how they imagine going forward or they don't. And then the last element that was particularly important to me on this was the role of social institutions in these experiences. So these formulas of persecution and victimization then became part of how, how we think about going forward from three very discrete experiences. One saw the need for liberation of shackles that became the image that motivated generations of Barbadians to consider themselves as new beings, subjects in the world. In terms of colonialism, that map is really critical. The Brink map, while that's an intriguing kind of uh, historical object, beginning in the 20th century after uh, uh, the rise of African, Pan-African nationalism, you start to see a whole 
slaw, uh, a whole um, group of scholars and politicians beginning to argue for new maps that they no longer want to be defined by the maps of the colony. They want maps that focus on their tribal links, their family links, their communal links. And then we get to the Holocaust. And what was astounding to me was that there wasn't a place in so many of these Holocaust survivors, there wasn't a place to move from, uh, how can I put this? They found themselves in that ends nullius spot and there was nowhere else but ashes. They, this is really the amazing thing. And it's why one of the things when um, Professor Parnas was discussing uh, the, the Ziegelbaum, uh, Adele Ziegelbaum, I'm always impressed by how incredibly brave these individual people were because truthfully, each of these individuals had to stake out a whole new subjective space in order to survive. They had to do something that as a group was being denied them. This is really a, a kind of incredible moment. So, those formulas of persecution victimization led me then to challenge the continuity theory, to try and come up with a way of thinking about victims that was not reducible to in fact their victimization, but that in fact that elevated to quote Imre Kertesz, the person that allowed these individuals to move from the objects of categories to being subjects that allowed them to re be restored to some extent. And so one of the things that I, I tried to do with this text was to look specifically at that. Now, the stakes of this then become clear in terms of how genocide studies works. And for that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this element. So. This begins with the work of Jörg Zimmerhoff. And I don't know if um, you've studied Jörg, but Jörg Zimmer was the founder of a second genocide organization, the ENOGS or the International um, Organization of Genocide Scholars. He is often compared to Israel Charney who founded the original organization of genocide scholars. The two groups rarely talk in terms of their intellectual trajectory. Uh, trajectory. And in fact, um, as late as 2016, I think it was, uh, Enoch's, York's organization met in Jerusalem and Israel Charney came back with a very damning criticism of this organization saying that it did not um, pay close attention or pay enough attention, uh, attention to Jewish victims and the Holocaust, that they had somehow subsumed the Holocaust to genocides in general. And knowing Jörg as well as I do, I was surprised about it because I really, I was thinking to myself that it is true that he advocates this continuity theory, but I've never known him to displace or even to demean the victims of the Holocaust in any way. So that was one aspect of it. And I began as a result then to think very strongly about his project. And so to some extent, I trace the subjective experiences of these three groups as I've explained them to you in very brief form. Slaves in the Americas, colonized Africans and Jewish extermination camp deportees to compare the concepts and principles they use to survive persecution. And then to wonder in posit perhaps is there, are there connections, meaningful connections between these three groups? From the outlines of these experiences, I examine how persecution was intuited in victim groups in order to demonstrate that the epistemologies of persecution, what victims intuited and what victimizers did or applied are not necessarily reducible to each other. And that doesn't 
that doesn't invalidate any aspect of either genocide prevention or the study of these different events. It doesn't invalidate. It just says that there's a particularity that you have to recognize. Now, this difference presupposes that persecution extends beyond its role as such data and that it seeps into both victims and victimizers senses communis, their common sense or shared sense of who they are, internalized as part of a sensibility about the self and how that self belongs to an imagined community. And to that end, I tried in this text to view how scholars, uh, I mean, I tried to trace how scholars view persecution as an object, the unarticulated concepts that legislate the interpretation of its data, and what is lost inevitably in discussions of persecution that do not focus on or even include victim experiences. And, and that's the critical element for what I do. As an object of knowledge, scholars describe persecution usually in terms of its quantification. How many died? How many were affected? How many were tortured? And the causes we ascribe for its occurrence. And you saw that last week in your lecture as well. The, because especially in terms of genocide prevention, you do have to look for causes and you do have to look at these kinds of um, attitudes that could trigger or generate a genocide. Sure. Why did it happen? The amount of data gathered becomes meaningful objectively. Becomes meaningful objectively through patterns we dedu deduce in order to construct a causality behind events, implicitly posited as a narrative, a history. Thus, histories of persecution routinely rely and include the number of dead and maimed, the property lost, the objects scholars can list, the data they can collect and the bodies they can count, always with a view to revealing persecution's causes. That's how we approach it formally, the study. The problem is the obvious one. We miss the human subjects who experience persecution in favor of counting their corpses, ad adumbrating the ways they suffered or sifted or sifting through the remains of their social institutions. Human subjectivity becomes a gloss for bodies as oppressed objects. John Blassingame, the historian of slavery, of slave subjectivity, first described the tendency in relation to the history of slavery. He recognized that it ensued from the kinds of primary sources historians use to determine what happened, how slaves' bodies circulated and where they were confined. Inevitably, this orientation reduced slaves to their bodies, and this reduction represented them as objects within epistemology. It was all about how we organize knowledge. Now, Blassingame proposed the need to shift attention from slaves' bodies to slave subjectivities. And the sources for this attention had to be autobiography or autobiographical because more clearly than in any other source, this was the only way to discover who they were. And so the, since the personal records of slaves, their letters and diaries were few, blasting game, noted that the autobiography provided the details of what went on in the minds of black men, a knowledge excluded in the commentaries of outsiders. So one of the things that we see in the study of slavery is now this beginning to understand that we need to know the subjectivity of the individual victims. Just like we need to know the subjectivity of the victims of colonization, and then we also need to know the subjectivity of the victims of the extermination camps. Blassingham contended that a scholarship focused exclusively on observable data, set aside the personalities and subjectivities of persecution's victims in order to construct the larger schema of slavery as a system. And while understanding slavery as a system was an important goal, it was not the only goal. So what I tried to do was to map then 
that schema onto these two other case studies in order to get at what needs to happen in genocide studies and Holocaust studies. To make the field relevant to those victims so that they don't become reducible to the numbers and the facts we can quote. That lovely anecdotal story that Professor Parnas told about Adele Zingelbaum, that lovely anecdotal story that restored to her the status of being a subject at the threat of extermination, at the threat of being erased from human history, that's an incredibly powerful aspect that needs to be exposed more and more within genocide studies. It needs to be, become part of its narrative as much as part as, um, as identifying the data of genocide. A similar tension runs through Holocaust studies. Saul Friedlander characterized it as the missing internal history of the Jewish people during the years of persecution and extermination. And like Blasing, Blasing Game, Friedlander argued that the orientations of scholars toward German and related policies during the Second World War occluded the properly Jewish dimensions of the events in order to posit the Jews as passive victims and amorphous mass whose history could be reduced to mere statistical data a given percentage of the Jewish population exterminated in such and such a country. And Friedlander saw this occlusion as a scholarly tendency to displace the large number of diaries and letters written by Jews of all countries, all walks of life, all age groups, either living under direct German occupation or within the wider sphere of persecution. It reflected a desire to focus on a collective subject position shared by the many in which the victims remained manageable data rather than specific individuals within a community who it resisted, negotiated and lived through persecution. I mentioned Hendrik Witboy because Witboy was one of those heroes of the Nama whose life came to, who found himself, let me rephrase that, who found himself with a choice. The Germans were going to massacre the Nama if they didn't agree to serve them as part of their military uh, guides. And Whitboy, in his diaries and his letters, talked about this decision he had to make and he stayed with the German army until he couldn't do it anymore when the 1903 to 1906 genocide broke out. And it was a genocide and it was aimed primarily at the Herero because the Germans thought that the Nama would support them and help them. But then the Nama rose up in 1903. And so they had suddenly their German military had two fronts fighting in German Southwest Africa against them. Whitboy would die uh, in the conflict. But what was amazing was what he wrote at the end when he decided to leave the German colonial project and fight for indigenous rights. He made a very specific argument. He saw his mission as a divine one. It was something that he was called to do. He had to be a subject and he had to be a leader of his people, even though he knew that the outcome was certainly dire and it would not go well. In fact, today, the last census taken in Namibia, Herero and Nama number so there are so few numbers of these two of the, that were the largest group in German Southwest Africa. They're so few today that they don't even have a, a, a place on the census to check. They are indeterminate tribal and that's it. And it's amazing to me because 
the effects of the genocide on them. They never came back. But now we're beginning to see within the subsequent generations of this group of Nama and Herero that were killed, we're beginning to see new stories where they're beginning to tell the story of their lives in, an, in the Namibian public sphere, even if it's not one that is acceptable to Namibia as a nation state, but it becomes tied to this idea of them as victims and being subjects again. Anyway, the persecution that I wanted to look at was tied to these formulas of genocide. And I wanted to think about it in relation to how genocide scholars think about it. And this became Jörg Zimmer and A. Dirk Moses. They are the two primary figures in genocide studies today in the new generation of German scholars, German studies scholars and German historians that are in fact talking about continuity. Their claims have since found purchase within Holocaust studies, post-colonial studies and German studies. And consequently, they appeal to scholars to look more carefully at the concepts underpinning these two historical precursors of imperialism and colonialism to understand the Nazis genocidal intent. Zimmer's approach hinges on posited structural parallels, usually syntactic and linguistic signifiers that appear in the Herero Nama genocides of 1903, 1904 and 19, through 1908, conducted by the Germans in Namibia. And in the Germans treatment of Poles during the Second World War. So this becomes a structural link for Zimmer and he's going to argue then that the Nazis project wasn't specifically directed at Jews, it was a colonial project. And my argument has been to look at this precisely as a problematic rendering because of what happens to those Jewish victims. Their specificity is suppressed in order to make an argument about the victimization of the many, right? Now, He maintains that these parallels, these structures have been largely ignored, even avoided by Holocaust historians, but these shared structures were evidence that the German war machine against Poland and the USSR, USSR was the largest colonial war of conquest in history. And in that statement, he, he, he sutures the entire experience of World War II to the idea and the experience of colonialism. And to justify the claim, Zimmer shifted his focus to assert that two elements, no longer only Nazis, but also Germans, these two elements were the agents of war, and these agents fought against Poland and the USSR. So their enemies are not Jews, their enemies are Poland and the USSR. Their goal is territorial, it's the map, and their hope is to gain space, right? Now, he argues then that one of the, this shift freights the Nazis actions towards the Poles with a historical narrative of German bias, linked intimately through the shared term inferior. Germans had referred to both groups as their inferiors and the reference constituted a shared structure embedded both in German colonial policy in Africa and in German fears over the territorial encroachment of the East on its borders. Thus the presence of shared structures tethered the Holocaust to a historical precedent associated with the East as a non-specific signifier. And in all of that, in that moment, what becomes important are the structures rather than the cost in human victims, rather than who those human victims were. By making this equivocation between Poles and USSR as the actual aims of the Nazis and not looking at Jews specifically, he makes then an, a huge group. He literally creates a huge category of multiple victims and they're all interchangeable as far as uh, their status as objects. The only thing that differs is in the degree of their persecution. So Russians, Poles, Slavs, Jews, and Roma are all linked through victimization. And this becomes the basis for understanding genocide 
as a German construction that has its roots, as he put it, in the largest colonial war, the Nama and the Herero. Now, One of the things that I wanted to then contrast for you in that model, the structures are the only thing that's important because they allow you to map the data of genocide. What I wanted to do was to look very specifically at what it meant to the victims in these Reinhardt camps. And so the first example I'll give you is Rudolf Rader from Belzec. For those of you who don't know about Belzec, it was the first of the Reinhardt camps. It operated from 1942 to 1943 in the general government in Poland. The Reinhardt camps were virtually unknown outside Poland until 1959 when their guards who were indicted in Germany for war crimes conducted in the euthanasia program referenced the death camps, the Reinhardt camps. Their inadvertent references were excluded from the legal record. Belzec was an experimental camp in that the Nazis had yet to perfect mass murder by gas, and so they tested various methods of extermination at the site. We think somewhere between 500,000 to 600,000 Jews were killed during its operation. And of the handful, handful of people who survived Belzec, up until I think it was literally this decade, we really only thought of two people surviving Belzec, one of which was Rudolf Reis uh, Rader, and the other was Chaim Herzmann. Chaim Herzmann was killed after uh, testifying in Poland, after being uh, after escaping and then testifying about the uh, the Nazis. He was killed on the steps outside the courthouse. Rudolf Rader is an interesting figure. He gives a very complete story on August tenth, nineteen forty two. The Nazis sealed the Lvov ghetto and evicted the Jews from their homes and workshops, of which he had a workshop, collecting them in a field where they were forced to sit on the wet well ground until the next morning. Anyone who stood up during this time was shot immediately. And at 6 a.m. the next day, they were loaded into, uh, they were brought to the Kaparov train station and were loaded into cattle cars or train cars and taken to Belzec. In Raider's freight car, he says, no one spoke and everyone knew they were to be killed. And they were already within the space and time of experiencing extermination. Now, after his arrival, Raider was removed from the transport with a small group of men to dig graves for the corpses. He now belonged to the permanent death crew of which he estimated was a workforce of 500 men. Within that group, 250 were designated skilled laborers who had to sort the Jews' belongings to cut and collect the women's hair before gassing to drag corpses from the gas chambers to the burial ports, uh, pits. But 450 were always occupied with the graves. 450 were always occupied with the graves. Every day, 30 or 40 of these workers were set aside from the details and shot. And it reinforced for him that his reprieve from his transports gassing was, tra was temporary. The Nazis intended to kill him with all the other Jews. No one was to be saved, no one was to be spared. Shortly after he began his task of digging, another transport arrived in which he recognized his family members among the victims, but his experience was not unique. In our working group were many men whose wives, children, or parents had been murdered in Belzec. Consequently, the work details digging the burial pits became numb rapidly to seeing their families among the victims. They just became numb, right? And Rader remembered several discrete experiences whose repetition every day, two to three times a day, imprinted them on his senses. The first occurred around the arrival of transports. There was one officer in particular, Ehrman, who waited at the platform for each transport. And after the Jews were beaten and whipped, out of the freight cars. He told them that showers awaited them and then they would go to work. 
And the second incident again included Ehrman. The Nazi officer enjoyed shooting disabled Jews from the transports at the edges of the burial pits and then kicking their corpses into the pits. And Rader extended Ehrman's pleasure to all of the Nazis as they performed their duties, how happy they were when they saw naked bayoneted people being chased into the chamber indifferent to the cries of children. The third episode concerned women. The transport coming from Poland were, according to Rader, dominated by women and children, and the women were forced to run to the gas chambers, the path covered in blood, their cries in Polish and Yiddish. And the only variation on his memory was the realization that later, after the shutting of the doors to the gas chambers, the cries in Yiddish became Czech, Greek, and French, and his detail was assigned then to drag the bodies from the gas chambers to the burial pits that they had just dug and that were hidden in the forest. Rader would escape, and Rader would also testify to how Belzec's pit of corpses became a pit of ashes. And one of the things that Rader talked about afterwards was how he felt he was homeless. He survived. He escaped, he survived, and he felt he lived his entire life afterwards homeless. He walked streets, even when he immigrated, left Poland, he walked streets to tell people who he was and who his family members were and how, who, how they died and how he never got to see this person again, but this is what he had to do. Part of his subjectivity and part of his becoming a a subject again, was the need to tell that story, that individual story over and over again. When we talk about genocide as an epistemology, one of the things that alarms me is how often we talk about it in terms of categories and data, and we don't talk about it in terms of these individuals. It's easy well, it's not easy, but it is easier to remember how many dead. I can give you the amounts of each Reinhardt camp. I can tell you all sorts of data about each of these camps, but it's a lot. It is an obligation, may their memories be blessed that we tell their individual stories that we talk about who they are today, who they have become, and that we not exclusively remember them as to what they were. Now we go back to that picture of ashes. When I asked Dr. Ornstein, when I asked her about what do you do, how do you reconstruct the self? after living in proximity of smelling the ashes of these pits. Another um, example of this was one of the members of the Zonderkommando at Auschwitz, Venezia, uh, Shlomo Venezia, who talked about, he worked in the actual crematoria itself. And he would talk about how at the end of the day, after moving the bodies out of the gas chambers, their skin would stay literally on his hands. There was no way of washing this off. And one of the elements that came back over and over again was how do we talk about becoming a subject again after experiences like this? If victim phenomenology is this extreme, what do we do? And so I, I asked Dr. Ornstein about this and she came back with another story. The story was specifically that she remembered relationships. She remembered the relationships, the relationship she had with her mother, the relationship she had with a friend. She remembered these and these relationships helped her. And then she remembered all the relationships to those people that didn't survive. 
And those relationships obligated her to keep telling her story. That very personal, singular, individual story. One of Jörg Zamora's claims was that we needed to freight genocide studies no longer in the specificity of Jewish victimization in the Holocaust, but to see it on a continuum of many different kinds of genocidal victims. That these victims became to some extent, they became to some extent interchangeable. And my argument was precisely no. We understand how to prevent genocide better when we understand the human stories of those people who survived it and who remember those who didn't survive it. For me, as a scholar, and I'm, I'm speaking very informally to you, and I realize this, for me as a scholar, the most critical element of Holocaust and genocide studies is understanding these individual narratives. I don't know that genocide studies will ever agree on a lot of different topics and issues within it. But what we have to think about in terms of, of these case studies is what, what happens to victims. So for me, these three case studies of slavery, colonialism, and the Holocaust, they were three different historic events. And yes, they're victims. You could talk about them in really just in relation to the amount of dead, and you could make some equivalencies that way. But what I wanted to show was that the formulas that underpin those historic experiences are not the same, and they demand different remedies but all the victims demand our remembrance. And so that's how I'll end my formal presentation for you. Katie, thank you very much. It was very moving, very provocative. I hope that uh, some of our audience has questions for you. And if anyone does, please submit them now through question and answer. Anyone? Hmm, they're still taking it all in, I'm sure. That's all right. There we go. There. One audience member comments absolutely just shook me to my core. Really <laughs> appreciate this need and thank you so much for your talk. Well, uh, thank you, and uh, it was an honor. Um, I admire very much what this series has done historically and what you're doing right now. And like I said, I really, I think it's uh, very critical. Yes, Cynthia, there's another um, question. That, oh. Yeah, if, if, if a student has a question, we should ask that. Um, sure. Yeah, um, okay. So the question is that you wondered why I wasn't mentioning the Armenian genocide. Um, I, I talk about the Armenian genocide in, uh, in relation to Lemkin and in relation to this. Um, it's what I was trying to get at was that there are lots of different historical events and I could talk about all of those, but that's not actually my focus. My focus is on victim phenomenology. Now, if we wanted to talk about individual Armenians um, in relation to this, this is a very different scenario than what I normally work on. I teach it, but it's a very different scenario. Um, what I'm trying to get at is a way of thinking a different strategy in relation to genocide altogether. 
the given is that we have genocides. We know they exist. There's nothing debating that. I don't debate that at all. What I'm trying to get at is how we can differentiate among victims without reducing victims yes. to objective status. And also how we can talk about individual victim experiences without losing them in historical data. And you know, one of the, the things that's interesting, I don't know if you've ever uh, accessed the VHA, the Video um, Heritage Archive at USC, um, but they have some of the, the remaining home movies from Armenians who survived the genocide. It's one of the few repositories. They're not, they're home movies. They're taken by the individuals themselves. They're not like normally when you go to the VHA or when you access it through your laptop or something, you're seeing very professional uh, materials. But the nature of this was that we don't have any kind of individual speakers talking about the Armenian genocide, their experience of it as subjects, as individuals, except for these had this handful of home movies that were brought into the archive. I, I think Stephen Smith, the director, said that um, they received this as a bequest. And so if you're interested in that, that would be a great place to think about looking at it. So you have free access to it as a student, I believe, but it's particularly important for understanding how these, um, how individuals who survive it try to remake their lives. All right. The audience member asks, why was Belzec not written on the legal record when it was initially brought up? Well, okay, so the Reinhardt camps were particularly, um, uh, particularly unique. So the Reinhardt camps, one of the things that happened because, and they were linked to the euthanasia program prior to that T4 program. Uh, but one of the things that happened with Reinhardt camps is that they realized that if the surrounding communities knew what they were doing, they would not, um, they, there could be a possibility that either Jews would, re, you know, would revolt against being sent there or that the communities themselves, the resistance members in the area might actually you know, attempt to stop this. So they, what they did was they created um, fantasy scenarios. Uh, for example, Sobibor had a little train station at the platform and they made the, uh, the gas chamber look like a synagogue. They had bowls of flowers on the steps leading up. They, they made everything look so that the individuals being brought into it would not think we're going to our deaths until it was too late to be able to do anything. That's an incredible point. At, at one point, one um, in the handful of survivors of the Reinhardt camps are particularly limited. You're not looking at a lot. Belzec, two, two adults. Uh, Sobibor and Treblinka, less than 50. Mm. So the reason why Belzec wasn't included in the legal narrative was that truthfully, they didn't want that to be known. Remember, these are Nazi guards that were being brought up on charges tied to the T4 euthanasia program. If they, if it was known that the Nazis had engaged in exactly this, I mean, one of the arguments that they could make about um, the non-dedicated death camps, some places like Auschwitz or some of the other camps, Mauthausen, um, Maginik, Maginik uh, you know, was that these were places where political discontents, i.e. Jews, where they had to go and work and that you know, they, they could make up lots of narratives about it. But the Reinhardt camps were really designed for only one thing, they were going to eliminate from the general government all Jewish life. It was what, and then it became expanded because they weren't just bringing Jews, Polish Jews in, they were bringing in Jews from all over Central Europe, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. So to some extent, they were trying to protect themselves from double jeopardy or from uh, you know, being made responsible for acts that they didn't want anyone to know. And yet, ironically, and this is also another element, um, one survivor of, of Treblinka, he was uh, 
charged with uh, with um, bringing the bodies out of the gas chambers into the ash pits, uh, into the onto the uh, railroad ties that they used as grates, putting them on that, burning them, and winding this the whole time. And he tells an incredible story about um, being there while the Nazis held a huge feast celebrating the destruction of the Jews. And they felt like they were going to be rewarded by Himmler for doing this. And they were so excited about it. They were getting drunk and they were banqueting while he was there, you know, and, and then he talked about when he escaped, one of the elements that was, you know, very real to him was the fact that as the Nazis were dismantling these camps, because they didn't have them in operation at the end of the war, they dismantled them, all of them by the, uh, I think it was the first quarter of 44, they were all taken apart and then they were reconstructed to look like farms and colonial settlements. So that Hitler could say, we're not doing anything different than what any other colonizer has done before. And by the way, that's an exact quote from how Jörg Zimmer describes genocide and German not and the German Nazi project in relation to German colonial projects, in relation then to European colonial projects until we get all the way back to antiquity in Sparta. So know very clearly bells that couldn't be mentioned because that they would have been culpable. And if they're culpable, I mean, 1959, do you realize how long that, that secret was kept? That picture I showed you, that was in 1960. So they had just discovered, literally just discovered what that, that, what that mountain of sand or ashes really was. Okay, what else do we have? Oh my goodness, we've got 12 here. questions. I know they're loading up. How do we deal with the particularity of the experiences of victims when now we have so few survivors still able to speak? Is it our responsibility to encourage and seek out their descendants to share these experiences and keep them alive? Well, that is certainly the perspective uh, of, in fact, the Holocaust Center in San Francisco, that they are now taking the children of survivors to talk about how this has affected them as well. And I think that's a very good strategy. But let me give you another one. And this comes right out of slavery. And I think it's really, it has its problems, but I think it's really kind of a very interesting one. Um, Sadia Hartman writes a book uh, um, lose your mothers, but she advances a theory of fabulation. And it starts when she gets a Fulbright to go to Africa. She's going to write about women, uh, uh, victims of, of slavery who were women. She's going to do a gendered history. But when she gets there, there are no records to examine. There are no records because those victims died without you know, narratives. One of the reasons why I chose Barbados over the Americas was because we had the earliest slave narratives of Ashi, a Fanta slave in Barbados. And it was, there was only one document that we could actually get to. So to go back to your question, Hartman advances a theory of fabulation that forces people to imagine, imagine these victims we used to talk about imagining victims in the Holocaust in very simple forms. And, and that, wasn't, that really wasn't what this is about. It was the idea of imagining them as subjects, recognizing them as part of us. So yes, it is a good idea to you know, look for you know, how these narratives, these stories, this part of being who they were was transformed and transmitted to their children, true. And also to begin thinking about how we imagine who they are and how their legacy goes on within us. I hope that helps. It does. One more question. How does the difference between the large number of Jewish survivor narratives and the relatively fewer narratives we have from other victims, for example, our American slavery, influence our more general understanding of genocide? Well, that's actually a great question. Um, and let me, let me all just kind of, um, let me correct that just a tad. And, and that's probably a bad term to use, sorry. It's been a long day for me here at San Francisco, our first day back. 
Uh, but let me just say this. So, for example, the VHA has, um, I think it's uh, 50,000 Holocaust narratives. I believe that's the last number I saw. But in terms of African American um, narratives, we have a lot of material. We have a lot of narratives that have never seen it out of the archive. Even the WPA project at the early uh, 20th century, even that project had incredible volumes and volumes and volumes. So I don't know that we have relatively fewer in terms of, of American slavery. We don't have the same amount, and here you're right, and so I'm just making a qualified response here. Um, I don't know why I'm getting all of these announcements of to, sh to be quiet. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to go over. Uh, but anyway, one of the things that is interesting here is that you're right in that first, very first set of generations, those first hundred years of slavery, we don't have a lot of primary materials or narratives. But then, but then we have a awful lot more afterwards when you finally start to see slaves being able to escape or finding their way to, to tell a narrative, having interlocutors that would listen to their stories. So I guess to some extent to respond even more specifically, we have to become interlocutors in history. By interlocutor, we have to be able to be the person who listens and talks to these subjects. We have to, to use Hartman's term, we have to engage in a little fabulation, but a lot to hear their voices, to imagine hearing their voices. Alan Rosen wrote an incredible book looking at the case studies of Holocaust survivors in that first year. And it was the wonder of their voices. He was quoting the psychoanalyst who went and, and with the old tape recorder went and, and taped these narratives, the wonder of their voices. May we all experience the wonder of their voices. And as we explore transnational analyses of genocide, and as we explore persecution, and as we explore social justice, may we hear the wonder of their voices. Kitty, on that note, we thank you. It's been a pleasure to meet you. We're so I'm so glad we finally had you here. And thank I you. hope we meet again. Me too. Thank you for that All incredibly right. powerful talk. Well, thank you. And for those of you who I did not get to respond to your question, uh, please feel free to email me at San Francisco State. <laughs> I'm in the Bay Area, so I can answer all right. sorts of questions. Oh, and, um, and thank you for bearing with me. I realize I'm not quite your regular uh, lecturer, but uh, thank you. And I understand uh, the Alliance. I will go on now, exit this, and go on to the link that the Alliance sent me. Is that correct? That's right. And thank you again, Diane. 